Sign. Calling to order the Cuyahoga County Committee of the Whole meeting for Thursday, July the 19th, 2018. Clerk, please call the roll. Calling the roll, Ms. Simon? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Schron? Mr. Schron is absent at the moment. Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Hauser? Here. And Council President Brady? You have a quorum. Um, yes. Public comment. Yes, sir, we do have some. Uh, mm -hmm. The first speaker is David Forte. Let the record reflect that Mr. Schron is in attendance. Good afternoon. Thank you for listening to me. Let us suppose this ordinance is passed. And in Cleveland, a custom T-shirt factory is opened, run by an African-American woman. White man comes in and he says, I wish I didn't have to deal with you, but I will. He says, I want a custom T-shirt for my America First group, which we're having a meeting tonight with the Ku Klux Klan. I want it to say, black lives don't matter. She says, I don't want to have to do that. He says, well, listen, I've got an ordinance, and there are no exceptions. And even though it's only preponderance of the evidence, each count's going to cost you $1,000. So you're going to do it or not? She says, but it's my right not to have to speak and do things contrary to my beliefs, not under this ordinance. Oh, and by the way, I want to use your restroom, the ladies' room. You can't use the ladies' room. Our female employees use that. Well, I'm sorry, it's a matter of gender identity, and today it's voluntary. I'm, I'm a female today. I get to use your ladies' room. You don't let me in? There's another count against you. You see, this ordinance wishes that there be equality. But it doesn't bring equality. It brings inequality. It doesn't allow people who have beliefs different from what's behind the ordinance to express their beliefs in their art. It doesn't allow that. There should be an exception, I suggest. This ordinance does not apply to the provision of an individualized service or product. Because that's contractual. That's individual. That's one to one. But it's not there. Why isn't it there? Because this ordinance is part of a culture war. Happily, we are reaching the point where discrimination against gay persons is ending. And it's ending in the right way. We are morally, as a people, becoming aware of the innate dignity and equality of our gay brothers and sisters. But this is not what this ordinance is about. This ordinance is about forcing people who disagree with certain aspects of the gay agenda to shut up or pay up. And it shouldn't be doing that. Three or four years ago, the people of Cuyahoga County changed the form of government because we were tired of people in power using their power to advance their own ends. And I wonder, to establish this bureaucracy, which will be intrusive into the schools against what parents want the schools to teach their children, which will threaten people with fines for simply representing the idea that they don't want to have to prostitute their art to a cause that demands that the art be prostituted to it, such as black, black lives don't matter. I suggest this may be a bridge too far for the council. It would be better if we continue to welcome our gay brothers and sisters the way we are, equal people without the coercive force of the law doing more damage than good. Thank you. Next speaker is Kevin Burke. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Burke. I'm general counsel of the Diocese of Cleveland. And I'm here on behalf of the diocese and Bishop Nelson Perez. Catholic Church has always taught that each and every person is created in the image and likeness of God and has an inherent dignity which must always be respected. In light of this, our society should certainly oppose all forms of unjust discrimination. At the same time, we have a duty to ensure that our society respects and upholds the natural and inalienable right of individuals and religious institutions to freely exercise their faith. 
and to uphold deeply held and reasonable beliefs regarding marriage, sexuality, and gender that are based on the unique physical, biological, emotional, and spiritual complementarity between male and female. With regard to the protections that this ordinance would extend on the basis of orientation and gender identity, this ordinance goes beyond traditional non-discrimination laws by requiring institutions and individuals to accommodate and to accept not just innate characteristics that a person may have, but also conduct which that person may choose to engage in. In light of this, it is important that religious institutions retain the freedom to hire and associate individuals whose conduct is consistent with their moral teachings. Likewise, government should not coerce or force people to promote or participate in conduct that they believe is morally wrong. Some will no doubt argue that I am making a request that you grant religious institutions the right to discriminate. This is simply not true. This morning, each of you received a copy of the ordinance, ordinance with revisions that the diocese proposes that you adopt should you decide to pass this ordinance. The changes we have made do not give religious institutions the right to discriminate against persons simply because they are gay or transgender, nor do they in, hinder in a meaningful way the ordinance's ability to ensure that gay and transgender people will find work and housing or receive the goods and services they, like all people, need and want. Without these changes we are proposing, however, the ordinance will have a very real and chilling effect on religious institutions, schools, and charitable organizations such as Catholic Charities of Cleveland. By way of example, the Archdiocese of Boston and the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., among others, we're forced to stop providing adoption services despite years of important work in this area that did much to promote the common good, all because a law similar to this ordinance forced them to choose between acting in accord with the Catholic faith and continuing to provide adoption services. Closer to home, the Diocese of Columbus faced criminal sanctions for violating a Columbus City non-discrimination ordinance when it terminated the employment of a teacher who chose to enter into a same-sex marriage contrary to church teaching. I ask you, does tolerance demand that religious institutions choose between engaging in public life and acting in accord with their moral principles? One more point. Should religious institutions and individuals have to pay fines and face criminal penalties simply because they wish to maintain moral integrity? I think the answer to that is no. I think this council can both protect gay and transgender people from discrimination and provide appropriate protections from, for religious liberty. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Diana Hill. I only got the resolution and got to read it two hours ago. I talked to Armand Budish on May 29th about creating Human Rights Council or Commission. In accordance with international law, the Department of State under the federal government has a Bureau of Human Rights. Their policy and procedure is not in alignment with what has been presented to the Council. The Civil Rights Commission under the Department of Justice under our federal government has policies and procedures. And we have one down in, at the State Building, the Civil Rights Commission. And I'm kind of confused about um, if the county's funding the Ohio Civil Rights Commission in any way, the ACLU, Legal Aid, or any of those agencies who all have the authority to uphold the um, federal laws on that. I totally disagree with the name of the Human Rights Commission being incorporated into this resolution as the name for a civil rights commission type agency within the government. I disagree with creating a quasi-judicial government that has appointed persons in charge of it who get to create their own law within it under Section G of its governance. I think that if you're going to create a quasi-judicial agency, that those persons should be elected. 
In addition, under the Human Rights Bureau, um, under the Department of State, that agency under the Human Rights Commission is created to, to police the governmental agencies. So creating a Human Rights Commission within the county that's being used as a Civil Rights Commission is not effectively doing what it was created to do at the federal level and the international level. I totally you know, respect the LGBT community, but you're creating anti-discrimination governance and codified ordinances that are subject to fines, as they said, and you're promoting it under the LGBT thing, but you're completely discriminating and, and neglecting to, to promote it under the countless disabled persons that you represent and the different agencies locally that all need retrained on ADA Title II law, which is chronically violating civil rights. In order to file a complaint for any of those problems, you have to go through the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Justice, Civil Rights Commission online to file that. It's such a bureaucratic thing to do. A lot of the people who are at those levels aren't able to do it. It would be great to have that here, but I think that some amendments need to be made. I have not had time to type them up professionally for you, and I will if you wish. But I pray that you guys will reconsider adopting this immediately until some of those things are redressed. Because as a business, the county seeks funding on these agencies, and they both qualify for Department of Justice and Department of State funding at federal levels to the county. If you're going to receive that funding, those agencies that you're creating should be in accordance with those federal and state laws. And I, don't, I see so many errors in here from my understanding of ADA law, civil rights law, that they're not in accordance with that. I know they put this together in a hurry. I respect it. I appreciate it. But it's incomplete and erroneous. So there's a lot of things that need to be corrected before you approve it, guys. And I hope you do. Thank you. Next speaker is Chris Canary. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Canary, and I'm the Associate Director of the Fair Housing Center for Rights and Research. It is my pleasure to join you again <laughs> and speak to the importance of the proposed countywide human rights ordinance. At the Fair Housing Center, we assist people who have experienced housing discrimination and understanding their rights and options for relief. We welcome Ms. Hill and others like her who have experienced or have concerns about housing discrimination to contact us for help. Having countywide protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity is a critical step towards fulfilling the fourth goal in our county charter, an improved focus on equity for all our communities and citizens. It's been our pleasure to work with our partners here today the county and council in support of this legislation. The proposed amendments in the revised version Mr. King will review later in this session are in large part critically important to ensuring that this ordinance can fulfill the promise it is designed to make. The discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity has no place in Cuyahoga County. And that LGBTQ residents of Cuyahoga County deserve the same rights and protections in housing, employment, and public accommodations regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And that goes for non-LGBTQ folks as well. It's regardless of one's sexual orientation. There are two points I wish to speak to today regarding the proposed amended ordinance. First, section 150105, violation and remedy, still does not include relief for victims of discrimination. Federal and state law both provide for victims to recover actual damages. By omitting this provision, the county creates a sort of less than status and fails to provide equal treatment and protection on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Secondly, section 150102D, false statements, has been added that would allow for a civil penalty to be imposed upon any party that filed a quote unquote false complaint. Again, as this is not provided for within federal or state laws, and as this ordinance will only serve to benefit victims of discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity, because all other claims will be passed on to other enforcement authorities, it seems to treat LGBTQ victims of discrimination differently and with a higher level of suspicion than other victims of discrimination. Though the language specifies that an unsubstantiated claim will not automatically be deemed a false complaint, 
the possibility that filing a complaint could result in a civil penalty, adding financial harm to a very personal injury may deter a victim of discrimination from filing in the first place and may be used as a looming threat by respondents to intimidate folks from filing. The fact that it does not exist in federal or state law should be indication enough that false complaints are not a widespread problem. And we should make this law as unintimidating as possible to encourage those who do experience discrimination in Cuyahoga County to feel safe and supported should they choose to report it. Thank you very much for your time and your continued consideration. Susan Becker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Becker, and I'm here on behalf of the ACLU of Ohio today. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for considering this ordinance and for the strengthening that you've done from the previous version. Specifically, the award of attorney's fees and costs to the claim at that possibility is certainly a move in the right direction, but we would encourage you to add other remedies that are commonly included in local, state, and federal non-discrimination ordinances that compensate the claimant for the actual <coughs> injuries they have endured, whether they be emotional or financial or um, other forms of, of injury um, uh, to the, the, the actual claim that the person injured would receive compensation. Secondly, um, I would want to I repeat what Chris Canary just told you about the, um, the false claim section that was added in there. We are unaware of any situation, any data that suggests that there have been false claims under statutes that have existed for a long time, other non-discrimination laws, and adding, uh, adding this provision will probably have a chilling effect on people who might have valid claims but don't want to relive this, the discrimination they suffered by going through a process again where they might face a penalty at the end. Um, finally, we would encourage you, if not in this ordinance, but in another ordinance, perhaps down the road or maybe an amendment to this ordinance, to think about other people who protected classes who suffer discrimination that really cripples their lives, people who are, for example, have a history of incarceration, who are trying to rebuild their lives but repeat, face repeated discrimination in many phases of their lives, as well as people who can afford housing only with the help of uh, housing vouchers who also face discrimination. Uh, I want to make two other comments. I would just stress that this is not a cultural war that we're talking about. What we're talking about here and what you're doing very bravely today in considering this ordinance, it's part of a civil rights movement that began shortly after the very beginning of this country. And the goal is to make sure that every person in society is treated under the law with equal <coughs> rights and dignity and respect. And if history teaches us anything, it's that our individual moral compasses are not going to accomplish that goal. Thank you. Next speaker is Molly Whitehorn. Hi, my name is Molly Whitehorn. I'm with the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest LGBTQ civil rights organization. I came here today in support of this ordinance. Um, just as someone should not be discriminated against based on their race or religious beliefs, LGBTQ Ohioans should also not be discriminated against. Research shows that 47% of LGBTQ Americans experience discrimination um, in the job, if that have adverse job outcomes, such as being fired or denied a promotion. Four in 10 LGBTQ youth believe that the city they live in is not accepting of LGBTQ people. And this is our chance to show the rest of the country how inclusive Cuyahoga County is. The fact of the matter is that LGBTQ Ohioans are Ohioans, and we need to be on the right side of history. Thank you. The next speaker, and I hope I have this right, is Sherry Bowman. Okay. Uh, Gwen Stemridge. Thank you, yes, we're from the same organization. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elena Jokum, and I'm Executive Director of Equality Ohio, our statewide education and advocacy organization, and I'm also a proud Clevelander. Thank you for the time and attention you have put into creating this robust draft ordinance. Uh, it only continues to improve, and we are really grateful for its evolution and the serious time and attention that has gone into it. Discrimination against LGBTQ people is real, and this ordinance is a strong step towards ameliorating that. 
I just want to speak today because some today have suggested that this ordinance is somehow against religious protections. It is not. Religious freedom is vitally important, and that's why it's protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. It's why it's in Article I of Ohio's Constitution. It is why it is co-equally protected in this ordinance and in other such ordinances, more than 150 of these nationwide, um, and more than 28 states as well. Religion is very important and it is protected under this ordinance. Some testimony today also suggests uh, a misunderstanding of what gender identity or expression is. I want to offer our organization as a content expert and a resource to any council members who may have questions in light of that testimony about what it means to have a gender identity, something each of us in this room has. The stories of the LGBTQ people that you have heard from in the consideration of this ordinance should speak for the need of this. Um, we are grateful for your consideration of this and hope that you will pass the ordinance in its strongest form possible. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Liu. Good afternoon. Sorry, the least qualified person came again. <laughs> All right. Uh, before this meeting, actually earlier today, I was in the OHS again, the advisory board meeting. For the very first time, something about LGBTQ on the agenda. However, we all know the reason our shelters are not safe sometimes that's because people do have a problem staying or working with people who are different from them. And not just race, not just the height, uh, sorry, sexual orientation or gender identification is also a big part of it. Religions should be for everybody, but not really for everybody. Some people do not understand the religion they believe in is about love, it's about care, it's about wishing yourself and everybody better and do it. So lots of people actually misuse religion to go against other people. That happens in all the shelters almost every day. Somebody, just because I look different, without knowing my, even my gender identity, I could be discriminated just because of my complexion. So we finally will have an ordinance to make sure all the important issues will be addressed. That's really a very good start, an important start. I support this ordinance because I wish, doesn't matter just our community or even the shelter, could be a safe place. Your choice will help all of us to go for a better future, that's for sure. However, when you want to argue about people's gender identities, think about your own sexual behavior. Is that appropriate? Those people in general don't think about that much. So that will give them also a warning because we will have an ordinance to protect the people being discriminated because that's true. People losing housing, losing jobs because of that. That's very true. That's why some of these people are in different homeless shelters already. That's approved. Thank you. That's Good. it. All right. Um, <clears throat> before we call um, for the uh, administration and, um, and Mike King from our staff, um, we have a special guest. A few days ago, I got a call from uh, State Representative uh, Nikki Antonio, who has a, a background in this legislation uh, that is very significant. And uh, so uh, I invited her to be able to come uh, today and uh, have her piece. And I know she's uh, recovering from a little accident, so I'm glad you could make it today, Nikki. Thank you. So please um, go ahead. Actually, the accident is getting older, and I have, um, I'm recovering from uh, hip surgery. But thank you. Um, this, this represents my first uh, formal outing <laughs> since my surgery, so I appreciate um, you're making time in the schedule for me to address the body today. So I want to thank uh, President Dan Brady 
Vice President Jones and the members of the committee uh, for giving us time to be able to address um, this ordinance. Um, my name is Nikki Antonio. I currently serve and have served for the past eight years as the state representative for Ohio House 13. And that, rep that representation is Lakewood and uh, the parts of the west side of Cleveland. I also have the distinction of being the first member of the LGBTQ community to be elected and serve openly in the 208 year history of the Ohio General Assembly. I thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the anti-discrimination ordinance before the Cuyahoga County Council. This ordinance, um, I understand, updates uh, civil rights protections uh, for the LGBTQ community and also creates a human rights commission. I believe it's a fair proposal that will simply give people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender the same freedom to work, the same freedom to live where they choose, and the same equal, full participation in society just as anyone else in Cuyahoga County. For the record, I've introduced similar legislation in the Ohio legislature in each of the four general assemblies that I've been a part of. This past year, we got more momentum um, in, that the legislation has seen, has ever seen <laughs> since it was passed out of the House in 2009 under the leadership of then Speaker Budish. Uh, unfortunately, that legislation went to the Senate where it languished and then it died. Part of the unprecedented momentum this time around has come from the support of the business community and most notably the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. I know you've heard this said before in these testimonies because I listened to all of the former testimony that took place here. Um, they, for the very first time, have not only expressed their support of the legislation, they came and they testified in support of the legislation. Um, and that was an incredibly huge uh, step. Don Boyd, who is the Director of Labor and Legal Affairs for the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, said in his testimony, in advancing Ohio's business climate, the Ohio Chamber recognizes the value and the power of diversity. We believe that employees deserve robust protections from discrimination and that discrimination of any type has no place in the workplace. Everyone deserves the right to do their job without fear of being discriminated against. Our very own Greater Cleveland Partnership, our very own chamber, which is the largest chamber of commerce in the state of Ohio, um, they also came and testified. Alicia Washington, who's the Vice President of Government Advocacy for GCP, testified in favor of House Bill 160, explained their mission, which includes creating jobs, leveraging investment, and improving the economic vitality of our region, she said, for our members, this is key talent and economic issue. Ohio cannot truly be competitive in attracting the best and the brightest if basic civil rights are not available to all current and future employees. And I think that emphasis on future employees is very important. I certainly agree and appreciate the forward-thinking leadership of this council your consideration of this ordinance. I believe that all residents of Cuyahoga County, including those of the LGBTQ community, should have the chance to get ahead, to be full and complete citizens with the protections and promise of liberty and the right to take care of their families. They should ha not have to fear that they're going to be evicted from their home based on their gender identity or fired for the, from their job for, because of who they love. The basic fairness protections offered with this bill signals to prospective employees, employers, businesses, and investors that Cuyahoga County wants to be competitive and move forward into the future. There's been a lot of talk and emphasis on the punitive measures that may happen as a result of someone being discriminated against, and that's important. But I also want to emphasize that there is a proactive part to this legislation. That ability to convey to new people, new people, whether they're businesses, whether they're investors, whether they're prospective employees, people who may want to move to this region, to have this kind of an ordinance really sends a signal 
This is a place that's welcoming and open to you. This is a place that you can call home. I was part of a group that put together a civil rights commission. Um, we called it the Citizens Community Relations Advisory Commission in Lakewood. Um, it started before I even went to city council in terms of formation. When we went through the years of forming it, putting everything together, starting programming to really celebrate and advance the diversity of all the depth and breadth of the diversity in the city of Lakewood, put things up on our website that said the mission of the Citizens Advisory Commission was to celebrate diversity, was to promote it. Um, we got phone calls. As a city council member, I got phone calls from people saying, I was looking for where we were going to land. Where were we going to find a home? Um, maybe we were looking for jobs. And what they told us was, when I saw that mention of the fact that you had this Civil Rights Citizens Advisory Commission on diversity and that your mission was to celebrate diversity, we decided that was a place we could call home. We could bring our family there. Some of the families were LGBTQ families. Some of the families were young families that wanted to live in a place and bring up their children in a place where celebrating diversity was not just an afterthought, it was actually a focus of a community. And so I think it's really important that this can be so proactive for Cuyahoga County and the message that it sends to so many people who maybe don't know us yet. And maybe this is the way they meet us and find us. The idea of fairness and inclusion, they're not new to our county, our country, or our state. When we consider just a few statistics, and I know you've heard a lot of statistics, so I'm not going to repeat uh, the majority of what you heard. One that always stands out for me is more than 615 or 92 percent of Fortune 500 companies across the country today and over 60 top companies in Ohio demonstrate support of discrimination-free workplaces through their workplace policies that extend civil rights protections to LGBT employees. This change has come about. It's 92% now. In 1996, it was only 4%. So that's been an incredible growth that's happened in a relatively short period of time, um, but I think one that's significant. 12 of our four, of our four 12 of Ohio's four year universities have similar policies, including Ohio State, Youngstown State, and Cleveland State. I bring that up because this is the place where our students are coming from to come back home, to come back to work. So they're used to these policies and living in a place where these policies are prominent. Cuyahoga County has the opportunity to be a leader while ex exerting a competitive appeal to top employers across the state and recruitment from across the country to attract and keep a skilled creative workforce, protect workers, and join the 21st century. Some of Ohio's top companies embrace LGBTQ equality because they know it's good for business. In Ohio, they know it's good for Ohio's economy. They also know it happens to be the right thing to do. A Plain Dealer editorial from May 19, 2017 declared that Ohio should close the loophole that permits LGBT discrimination in Ohio. And they declared that, is, that the measure is long overdue and that the consideration for it should be nonpartisan. As members of this county council with diverse backgrounds, including business innovation, a commitment to jobs, fairness, the environment, equity, and economic vitality of our region, I believe this legislation is aligned with all that is the best about our region and all that this council represents. And perhaps the passage of this ordinance could help in our movement to pass similar legislation at the state level. I'm also pragmatic. I could use some help at the state level for sure. Because we know hardworking members of the LGBT community contribute every day 
to the health and well-being of our county. We work, we worship, we pay our taxes, we send our children to school, we attend school, we're civically engaged in communities, we represent our communities on city councils and school boards, municipal government, and yes, we serve even as a state representative and on days such as this, we provide testimony to work for the viability and sustainability of our communities. No one should be denied access to a home and all that comes with that responsibility. No one should live in fear of losing their job or being denied the right to pursue a career and be a contributing member of society. All citizens should enjoy the ability to participate in one's own community without discrimination. The words of our Pledge of Allegiance declare with liberty and justice for all, there is not any exception. It doesn't say for some, we say with liberty and justice for all. These civil rights are the fundamental building blocks of our American dream and Cuyahoga County has the opportunity through this proposed legislation to provide equal treatment for all who live in our county, to live, work, and recreate, because there's visitors that come as well. You've afforded me, afforded me the utmost uh, professional's courtesy, and I appreciate that, um, in this hearing. I'm very grateful for that. For all intents and purposes, we are public policy peers, seemingly equal, but currently not in the eyes of the law. Suppose that after these hearings today, uh, we decide to gather at a local establishment for, uh, for some, for some uh, local, for adult beverages, might need it after all of the hearings that you've had, um, and some refreshments. And we take everybody, all of the leaders from the community that have been coming and testifying, and we go to a local establishment. I, like every other member of the LGBT community, could be refused service and asked to leave, just because we are a member of the LGBT community. And I would have no recourse, none whatsoever. The question we have to ask ourselves, all of us, is, is that really acceptable? You have the power within your hands to convey to the public that every person deserves fundamental protections in order to fully participate in society, free from fear, harassment, and discrimination, regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender expression or identity. You have the opportunity to make this a reality to communicate through public policy, Cuyahoga County is open for business and prepared to fully meet the challenges of the 21st century and compete in a global economy. I leave you with the wise words of Julian Bond, the NAACP national chair, former chair. He said, civil rights are positive legal prerogatives, the right to equal treatment before the law. These are the rights shared by everyone. There is no one in the United States who does not or should not enjoy or share in enjoying these rights. Bond concludes, gay and lesbian rights are not special rights in any way because it isn't special to be free from discrimination. It's an ordinary universal entitlement of citizenship. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative Antonio. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, President Brady, I'd like to say um, we will have business cards available, although I'm very easy to find. If any of the members of the council have any questions that I can um, answer as follow-up, I'm happy to do that uh, through my office. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Mr. King, I believe we're going to start where we left off the other day. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to get this uh, PowerPoint up and running. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Michael King, Council Staff. I'm here to provide uh, a brief refresher on what this ordinance actually does, touch on a couple topics that came up uh, the last time this item was heard in committee, and to provide you with a brief summary of the proposed substitute that's before you today. 
Um, again, uh, this ordinance establishes a, uh, or sorry, as a quick reminder, this ordinance prohibits discrimination in the areas of housing, employment, and public accommodations, and would protect against discrimination on the basis of all of the listed protected categories you see on this slide, all of which are protected under state or federal law, except for the two categories of sexual orientation and gender identity or expression. Uh, procedurally, how this would operate is the, the ordinance creates a new human rights commission uh, that would be empowered to adjudicate complaints of discrimination at the county level. Uh, complaints of unlawful discrimination covered by state or federal law would be referred to those appropriate authorities at the state or federal level to, abo to avoid duplication of efforts and or venue shopping. And we'll get into further detail when we get to the proposed substitute on this. There have been a, a few changes related to the jurisdiction here. But as you can see on this slide, the Human Rights Commission would do all of the normal uh, uh, administrative adjudicative functions that a civil rights commission would typically do, including mediation, conciliation, hearing appeals, uh, and awarding um, a remedy. Um, currently, it's in the form of injunctive relief and civil penalties. Uh, and as was noted earlier, we're, go we're going to be discussing uh, the addition of reasonable attorney's fees in the proposed substitute. Again, uh, this ordinance is necessary because federal and state law fails to provide adequate protections for the LGBTQ community um, and that uh, the Ohio anti-discrimination statute provides no protections uh, on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. And again, this ordinance includes those categories as well as all of the other categories protected under state and federal law. Um, what the, the next slide uh, is really uh, a bit of a summary about the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. This item came up in discussion last time, and uh, we thought it might be helpful to provide a little bit of clarification on what exactly that case held. So by way of background, uh, the case is about a, a in 2012, a same-sex couple sought the services of a Colorado baker to make a cake for their wedding. The baker refused, citing First Amendment objections. Uh, upon the baker's refusal, the couple filed a charge with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission where they initially prevailed. Colorado, and at that time, Colorado had general public accommodation laws in effect prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Again, this was in 2012, so it was before the Obergefell uh, Supreme Court decision that um, made same-sex marriage legal nationally. Uh, the issue that came before the Supreme Court in this case were, were twofold. Um, first, the baker made the uh, claim that he was under uh, a compelled speech protection, the idea that uh, the anti-discrimination law would compel him to use his artistic talents to express a message with which he disagreed. And then secondly, raised a religious freedom objection, uh, suggesting that creating cakes for same-sex weddings would violate his right to exercise his freedom of religion. Uh, in the ruling, the Supreme Court, in a seven to two decision, upheld the longstanding general rule that religious and philosophical objections do not allow business owners or other actors to deny protected persons equal access to goods and services under a neutrally and generally applicable public accommodations law. But they ruled in favor of the baker holding that the baker's religious beliefs were not given, quote, neutral and respectful consideration by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Um, and just to give you uh, some context as to what that means, in the uh, ruling, the court cited the fact that at least one of the commissioners uh, said that the um, the uh, Colorado S Civil Rights Commission said that one of uh, the, the Baker's argument was one of the most despicable pieces of rhetoric that people can use and suggested that such religious arguments have historically been used to justify past atrocities such as slavery or the Holocaust. Um, so the Supreme Court basically said that the uh, Civil Rights Commission shouldn't should have given neutral and respectful consideration to the religious objection and failed to do so. And for that <laughs> reason, the Baker was entitled to judgment. Uh, the co court did not rule on the compelled speech claim that came before it, and it also um, did not rule on the religious, uh, create a blanket uh, standard for religious objections to defeat anti-discrimination claims. It simply said that the Civil Rights Commission should have weighed the Baker's religious freedom claim against the rights of the same-sex couple. So what does this mean for Cuyahoga County? Uh, the, the ruling does not invalidate current or proposed anti-discrimination laws, including this ordinance, nor does it establish a religious exemption to such laws. Uh, so what would happen if a similar case came before the Human Rights Commission that's being created here? Unlike the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission would be required to give religious objections the, quote, neutral and respectful consideration 
uh, to such ob objections and weigh them against the county stated interest in this ordinance of protecting its citizens from discrimination. Again, civil rights law is and will remain a complex and nuanced area of law, which is why this, this commission is going to be comprised of qualified attorneys. And, you know, uh, discrimination law has a whole host of legal standards, things such as um, hostile work environment, disparate impact versus disparate treatment, religious accommodations, sexual harassment, hostile, you know, hostile work environment, there's just quid pro quo. So there are a lot of legal standards here that aren't spelled out in most statutory law, but have developed over the years in the case law. And so that's, that's part of the, uh, the analysis that would continue here. So at this point, I'd like to pause uh, to allow uh, for any other questions about the legislation as it was originally introduced. And um, depending on, as needed, I may I call up the administration or uh, other stakeholders, subject matter experts, to speak on that. Um, and then once we're done with that, we can move to the proposed substitute. So, um, Any questions for um, Mr. White, Mr. King? I always call him Mike White. I can't stop myself. I spent too much time at City Hall. He's a reporter. Questions? Sir, something, something got to be Council made some questions. Um, I know you just gave us a, a legal analysis of, of one case. Uh, what, if any, uh, would be the compelled speech that was just described by the, by, decided by the Supreme Court only about two weeks ago, three weeks ago in California in regards to uh, the issue of whether being a member of a, of a group was compelled speech, even though just paying dues uh, was was argued that it was not. Um, so, how do you do? You, uh, have any any input? Even though you said it was not decided on compelled speech, they certainly have decided subsequent to that a case very much on compelled speech, where all it was was uh, was a requirement to pay dues. I, I presume you're referring to the Janus decision. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not, I haven't read the, the full decision in that case, so I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to, to, to provide a full analysis on that. Um, I do believe that in, in that case, the issue was whether or not um, non-members of a, uh, uh, employees who were not members of a bargaining unit could be uh, required to pay association fees for representation in that unit. There was a previous case that required, that, that prohibited dues paid for um, political activities to unions. Um, this was that that original case was expanded to include this. Uh, I know I know in this case and during the oral arguments there was a lot of discussion around uh, what constituted speech and and whose speech it is. So if you know somebody were to come into a cake shop and ask um, somebody to design a case a cake with a message on it, was that message the message of the baker? Was it the message of the customer? And whether or not design elements built into that would be considered speech or be considered some type of craft. Um, and so the Supreme Court really, I think, decided to not rule on that, not try and draw that line. I understand um, that. But in the Janus case, the case clearly said that that was compelled speech when you had to be a member. So they have now ruled subsequent to this in a definition of compelled speech. So I'm and you, you indicated clearly that you did not know uh, what was going on in the background of that enough sufficiently to talk about it. So that's all I want to try and do is separate that compelled speech has subsequently been ruled upon. I don't, have no idea, none of us in this room have any idea how a subsequent court would rule on, on that same matter. Um, we had a gentleman come up and talk about T-shirts. Give me your thoughts about what he, what he had to say. Um, so the, the concept behind the T-shirts, I think it really comes down to when you look at whether or not the, the um, religious objections are bona fide religious objections. I think in the case of, it, for instance, the hypothetical that was given, the idea was say you had, um, in this instance, a, a white individual go into a black T-shirt owner's shop and say, I want a t-shirt that says black lives don't matter. And, and, the, and the distinction that was being drawn there was it was about the um, actions, not the sort of immutable characteristics of the customer. Um, but I think you can make the same argument to say that if you know someone went into a t-shirt shop, um, an interracial couple, for instance, and said that we want a t-shirt that celebrates our marriage, and the t-shirt uh, shop owner decided that they did not want to, um, because of their own moral objection to that, that, again, it, Yeah, I'm just asking you to stay so, with the facts of, the, of what was presented, not to bring up your own facts. 
Um, Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think in the hypothetical, it would really come down to, again, this is something that the, uh, the Supreme Court has not gotten into the compelled speech issue in, in application to these types of laws. They have not ruled on it in this instance. They, don't, they have not drawn the line as to what constitutes compelled speech and what does not. So we have no idea how they would rule on the T-shirt with a Klee Klatt Span member coming into an African-American T-shirt shop and asking to have that T-shirt made, is what you're saying? I think, I think again, that based on the standard that was established in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the, the commission would have to weigh the bona fide religious objections of the store owner against the, um, the, the, cl the protections that are being put forth through this law. Okay, so possibly you could go either way. Obviously, it's not a, it's not a settled matter. Um, why, why are we duplicating so many other provisions in this that are already in state and federal law? Why don't we just focus on on the LGBTQ community and, and, and not duplicate what already is in there and already protected and already has a remedy and which in theory looks like it could be a duplicate remedy for, um, for individuals that would go to the commission, be unsuccessful if it was, uh, if it was a religious issue and they got to, uh, went to the commission, raised the issue, and could they get a form of almost double jeopardy to, to then take it to the state or vice versa? So uh, in response to that, I would say the, the way the jurisdictional uh, aspects of this commission are structured is such that if there are, if there are instances of discrimination that are covered by state or federal law, that those claims will be referred to state and federal agencies. So you're not going to have that duplication. We'll get into that a little bit more detail in the proposed substitute. But I mean, I, I guess you could you could ask the same question about why both state and federal law. I mean, if if federal no, law that, that's discrimination, not, unfortunately, that's not our race, jurisdiction. You know, so we why, have to stay. Why yeah. would state law? I mean, I think the idea is that this this ordinance would be a statement that that Cuyahoga County does not or wants to provide protection protections against discrimination on all of the bases um, that are here. And and if state or federal law were to change, that those protections would remain in place. Okay. Um. The um, question about not being served the beer that the uh, state representative and Antonio talked about, I thought you gave me, gave us the impression that, that still would there would still it would have been a remedy in regards to that based on the way you described the the, the, the stores open to the public anybody came in and you were excluded that 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 there already is protection in, in regards to that. My my understanding is that under state and federal law. There are there is no remedy available to individuals who are um, basically denied service on the basis of their sexual orientation. But I I guess I thought that uh, the person is not making this a religious issue. They're not making anything in regards to it. So there would be would have been protection. I would have thought under Master Cake based on the way you presented it just a second ago. So in Masterpiece Cake Shop, there was Colorado has a state anti-discrimination law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. That is not the case in Ohio. Okay. All right. So that, Thank that's you. the dis I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman. Um, I haven't heard this yet, and maybe as we continue, so it might be an early question. Um, is this a permissive law? Uh, could you clarify what you mean by that? Is it uh, saying to our cities that you are mandated to follow what is passed here today, or are we saying that uh, you have the opportunity to take advantage of this law that we have put together and opt in? So how the, um, how, how the law reads does not place affirmative obligation on any individual city municipal government. What it does is it provides um, a general law countywide. Now, the county charter uh, exercises concurrent jurisdiction of municipal authority over the entire county. And what our charter says is that if a municipal corporation law, like a, a, a municipal ordinance, conflicts with county ordinance, that the municipal ordinance prevails. So it is not an opt-in, but hypothetically, if a particular municipality decided they did not want this particular law to apply to their residents, they could pass an ordinance of their own that would effectively opt out. Uh, theoretically, if they were content with the way that laws are 
and they have nothing on the books, to, as they probably don't, and they just don't want to opt out, opt in, do anything. Is, is that a viable response for them, or are they, if they have nothing on the books, automatically mandated to incorporate this into their law? If this, if this ordinance um, is enacted, the, uh, the requirements of this ordinance and the protections in this ordinance would go into effect countywide unless and until an ordinance, a municipal ordinance that conflicts with this ordinance is enacted. Is the, there a the way that our law can allow for an opt-in? It could, but in, in many ways that would be no difference from the status quo. I know at least four um, municipalities within Cuyahoga County have already enacted similar ordinances to this. So at any time right now, municipalities can enact their own um, protections. So in effect, it would basically be the status quo if it were drafted in that way. If I just may, way. is there a difference between drawing up their own legislation under their own rules versus opting into something that's already in place? Well, it would take, it would take an affirmative action to opt out of the county's ordinance. Right. So the city councils would have to take some type of affirmative action in order to, to opt out. Yeah, I, I understand that. It's easier to opt in than it is to opt out. And I'm just saying, do they have the authority not to opt in if they feel that they don't want to be part of this? If I'm they would have to take some type of affirmative step legislatively to opt out. And there's nothing in this legislation that we can do to allow them to opt in if they felt that they didn't want to draw up their own legislation, they just didn't want to participate at all. There isn't anything in here that says this is permissive. If you want to do it, you can. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. No, that, that it would, again, it would have to be an opt-out legislative enactment by the municipality. Right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Chair. Follow up on, <laughs> follow up on that point. I'll put your name down. My name is Well, Mr. I know you're pro both like pretty simultaneous. Um, I'm not going to flip a coin here, but I'm going to go to Simon. <laughs> you know, this opt-out question is interesting because it, 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 the law of the county is the law of the county, and what this does is gives rights to individuals to, to submit complaints, simply rights of individuals to submit complaints. So what the chair, um, my colleague is suggesting perhaps is that somehow the, the individual cities would be able to, to disallow their residents from submitting a complaint to the county, which really is what the question is around, is the rights of individuals, residents of this county, no matter where they are, you know, whatever city they're in, to, to come to the county and say, I've been discriminated against because of my race or because of my sexual orientation. So th the question about being able to preempt this really um, would be dis disallowing our residents from simply coming to a forum to ask for relief. It's not burdening a particular city. South Euclid wouldn't be burdened, or Fairview Park, perhaps, or Rocky River, or Westlake. The burden would be on an individual's being limited to come to this county, which I think, consistent with our practice as, as a council, we open this up to consumer affairs to allow our residents to come to us if they experience any kind of fraud on, on their, their bank account. And this is just another aspect of giving our residents a place to go. And why would we do that? Why would, you know, in this case, we're not duplicating what happens at the state and the federal, but we're giving our residents relief, potential relief. That's all we're doing. So it's not putting any kind of constraint on a community. It's giving our residents a place to go. That's what I wanted to say. I'm going somewhat in the same direction, uh, Mr. Chair, to, to, to Mr. King. Uh, am I correct that, that the ordinance as written doesn't require any municipality to do anything? It, it, it only uh, It only provides an opportunity for, for individuals who live in, anywhere in the in the county to file a complaint 
That's that's correct. There's no no um, obligation or mandate put on any municipal government or or township or village um, to do anything. It it simply uh, provides an opportunity for residents of Cuyahoga County to find relief at the county. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you indicated that four other communities have similar legislation. And what are the, the four? Uh, I'm going to phone a friend here um, from our 06. Oh, 06, oh, six. okay. okay. Lakewood, Olmstead Falls, Falls Cleveland. Cleveland, East Cleveland, East Cleveland. Cleveland Heights, Cleveland Heights and, South and South Euclid. Thank you. He had to repeat because that had to go on the record. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't you didn't hear. He just said it. That's right. Um, and of these, how closely is this ordinance aligned to any of those six? So um, I, I can't speak to how closely they're aligned to them individually. I've, I've reviewed a number of them. Um, generally speaking, I would say they, they follow the same general model of establishing a civil rights commission of some kind that would adjudicate claims at a municipal level. I know at least four of them um, have, you know, a relief similar to what's provided in here, uh, plus possibly including compensatory and or punitive damages. Um, but it's a similar type of structure as the county ordinance. All with the, with attorneys on the making up the entire Civil Rights Commission? You know, I, I would maybe defer to um, the subject matter experts on this one. I know I know the folks from McLaudy, Ohio, have, have helped uh, draft. Yeah, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Happy to, uh, to answer what we can. Sorry, um, I just have to put your name on the record. Sorry. Absolutely. Gwen Stembridge with Equality Ohio. So uh, the other communities, uh, the, the ones that we name as those six communities in Cuyahoga County all have protections uh, in employment, housing, and public accommodations, and based on sexual orientation and gender identity in addition to other uh, protected characteristics. So that's what kind of gets them on that list uh, from, from our perspective. Um, all of them, we've, uh, all of the ones that we've worked with, we've advocated for a civil remedy. Um, some have that and some do not. My colleague Elena can speak in more detail to that. My, my question was on the boards though, uh, the commission board. It, it, this, this is being recommended with 100% attorneys and we just got out of uh, this week we've had we've been here a long time believe it or not for committee <laughs> hearing and the IG question came up with whether that is a mandatory attorney and now we're telling us again that all three of these positions have to be mandatorily uh, attorneys so I'm just trying to ask are these other commissions consistent in having nothing but attorneys on in those communities or do they have a, a community person do they have a, a business person you know if you're telling us the business issue, I would think that one of these three would be a business person. If you're telling me it's a uh, GCP or something like that, uh, they're all uh, I'm just throwing that out as to find out what these other six look like. Sure, and for the record, my name is Elena Jokum with Equality Ohio. Um, each commission has somewhat different structure. Some have more members, for example. I think that some of the cities have chosen to go with five or even seven members. Um, none so far have required that all members be attorneys. I think that there were some policy discussions and considerations as to why this commission might include attorneys. Um, but no, no other uh, human rights commission has made that a mandatory requirement thus far. And how about of the six, how many have attorney's fees? I would have to come back after researching that. Okay, and how about um, of the six, how many have a penalty versus uh, some other um, remedy that could be put forth, um, injunction or something of that nature, though this is not clearly going to have that authority? All have a penalty of some sort. Um, most have a civil penalty. One uh, uh, municipality, Olmstead Falls, resorts to a criminal penalty, uh, which we do not also advocate. We think that a civil penalty is the strongest and best remedy for here. We want these to be constructive ordinances that bring people together and result in civil reparation and making of a person whole, not punitive and criminal uh, uh, othering. Um, but uh, I can't tell you unless we lay all six across as to the level. They do vary, but these are generally, this generally comports and frankly brings together in many ways the strongest elements of the municipal ordinances uh, with the caveat that we do advocate that additional remedies, those, those pieces that could give the committee discretion to make the plaintiff whole be added into this ordinance. Okay, thanks. Uh, the administration, uh, law department has Hi, something to add. Alata Fassad from the law department and uh, Councilman President, uh, Councilman 
the council and members. The reason why um, it was drafted as a requiring uh, that the commission be composed of lawyers is because um, it uh, serves as a quasi-judicial uh, board. Um, they will be reviewing and hearing, um, you know, evidence. And uh, this is an, uh, not different from the uh, PRC, which I believe all um, PRC uh, is composed of attorneys. But we just learned that none of the other six in, in the county have that requirement, and they're doing the same evidentiary, the same punishment, the same penalty, and yet somehow this one has to be all attorneys, and there's uh, the, the six that were referenced were not. Well, again, because it's quasi-judicial, um, we wanted to ensure um, that uh, the um, claimants and respondents um, have a fair and impartial hearing. And um, that, we just heard that one of them has actually criminal penalties. So uh, well, at least one, I don't know how many more, uh, have, in addition to civil, have, have potential criminal penalties, which I assume they're hearing evidence in order to get that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm questioning uh, the fact that if this is a commission, why it always has to why it has to be just be made up of this very very small select group of just attorneys. Well, I, I believe that they would be qualified to hear, and um, the standards that are in place. I mean, I don't have the ordinance in front of me. You know, the burdens of proof. I mean, it is it is like a, a quasi um, a judicial hearing. Um, and the other ones are not the other six. Uh, I just, I have a, I have a hard time understanding how, if we're modeling this and the, their models aren't the same, then uh, what, why the, the administration just picked 100% attorneys on it. Hi, Councilor. <laughs> um, uh, we're not here to judge the the uh, legislation that's been passed in uh, in other communities. No, I understand, I, just the, get, I understand yeah. the question. And uh, I think the law department answered what their answer is, at least, yeah, to the question. Okay. All right. I don't, yeah. um, so, you know, uh, I, don't, I think we should maybe move on. Okay, then the next is why is the executive the person appointing these as opposed to, if we're going to call it quasi-judicial, why don't we go to the probate court or something like that to, to appoint this body uh, out there? Like we have probate court appointing other members out there. If the executive is the one who took the podium a few minutes ago or a few days ago and spoke in favor of this then it should be it seems to me he has disqualified himself as being the person who should be the one putting those names we should go to get a truly an independent body to put those names forward i know initially they even wanted to have the uh, the persons inside the commission do it and i thought well that that's even worse uh, in, in that there was more slanted that we should go out to the probate court or get some third party to put that and put those names, we we use that for for other bodies and and uh, boards around here. Well, I so I mean there is uh, discussions underway to collab, uh, collaborate with the uh, CMBA, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, to develop a working group um, where we would um, you know advertise and have like a, a search um, team um, to identify and. Um, interview uh, prospective candidates okay. well, and and I believe that in the ordinance um, there is something uh, where it requires the council of approval of the commissioners okay uh, thank you the, confirm the appointment mr. chair yes Councilman. thank you um, you're correct I was gonna say this I agree with you that we're not we're not modeling this after municipalities and but our debarment board, for example, is comprised, composed of all attorneys because it's quasi-judicial. Um, consistent with our discussion with the IG's office a couple days ago, that it, you agreed or we agreed that a few of us at least thought that's important for lawyers to be there because it, in effect, it incorporates what lawyers um, have as knowledge in terms of due process and I don't see that this board would be any different from the debarment board and setting it up with the same selection method um, to make sure that we're able to have qualified people and, and that's that's pretty clear from um, the law department explanation. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilwoman? Uh, the six communities that have opted to um, write their own legislation and then we enact this legislation did I hear you say earlier that theirs would trump and be the one in control, or would they not? How would that work? 
it, basically, the it, it potentially it's possible um, how how it would normally work as a conflict analysis. Yes. So you'd look at whether or not the county ordinance and the municipal ordinance were in conflict, right. and in that case, um, the municipal ordinance would govern. Uh, I would suggest that maybe in most instances, I mean, there may be there may be certain areas where there's a conflict there, but in most instances, if municipal ordinance provides protections at a municipal level and the county provides protections at a county level, right. those two ordinances may not be in conflict. And so residents of that particular municipality could seek relief either at the municipal level or at the county level. But you'd have to look at that at a case-by-case -case basis, um, depending on what exactly the ordinance said and, and whether or not there was a uh, conflict determined to be between those two ordinances. So the one that was had the criminal aspect included how does that, and we do not, who would be the authority? So in that instance, I think it really depends on the municipal. So if the municipality says discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, for instance, carries a criminal penalty, the municipal ordinance would still be effective. Now, if somebody came to the county and filed a complaint of discrimination, that in and of itself wouldn't you know, start criminal proceedings. We would, we would handle it at the county level. But if there was a complaint made at a municipal level, that municipality could handle it however they've, you know, what, through whatever policies they've adopted. So that person who is filing the complaint would choose one or the other, understanding what each one, how each one read. Correct. And I mean, between municipal, county, state, federal, there are different protections and different right. remedies available. And so right. to a certain extent, you're going to see, you know, people filing complaints at different levels based on those factors. Okay. So. Thank you. To it'll be this will be easy, Council President. <laughs> okay, I, I I just want to ask um, where it says staff by an executive director. Is that going to be um, from existing staff, or are we creating a position? So I, I don't know if he's here today, but uh, I, my understanding is it's the executive's intention to appoint the county's current diversity inclusion officer, Luis Cartagena, who um, was a, was uh, hired shortly after the adoption of the MBE, WE programs that the county has to monitor diversity and inclusion on county contracts. He would basically move into the role and, and assume this as part of his duties as executive director of this commission, potentially if they need to hire additional staff, most likely I would imagine maybe clerical staff to simply handle complaints, that would be in there as well. but. It's the administration has stated that it's their intention, at least, you know, once this legislation is initially enacted, to appoint Luis to be uh, that executive director. Yes. All right. So moving on um, to the proposed amendment. So this before you today is a proposed substitute, um, and this was developed in consultation with the law department and uh, some key stakeholders. And it, these amendments were mostly developed based on the constructive feedback received from both the members of council as well as members of the public um, before or in the interim uh, following the last committee hearing. Uh, note that the substitute does include a number of non-substantive technical amendments which for the sake of brevity are not part of this presentation but if you see something in there that doesn't seem to align with what's in here or be uh, covered on under this presentation that's that's probably the reason why. Oops. So. Uh, the first amendment that I wanted to highlight is the um, concept of dismissal for failure to prosecute. And I know there was some discussion on this committee last time that uh, there was concerns that granting the commission the authority to dismiss complaints for quote unquote administrative convenience was a vague standard. Um, that was clarified by the administration and, and the law department that what was intended by that was a complainant's failure to prosecute if for re any reason they filed a complaint and then didn't follow through on that complaint or didn't cooperate in, in gathering evidence, et cetera, that the commission could dismiss that. So we've clarified that the dismissal is no longer for administrative convenience, but for failure to prosecute. Again, the, the commission can also dismiss complaints for lack of merit. Uh, next on this list is uh, the Office of uh, Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Again, we're gonna get into jurisdiction in just a second, but Currently, if somebody files a complaint that falls under state or federal law, they're required to uh, fi basically refer that complaint to the appropriate state or federal authority. Um, as it's listed in the 
uh, original ordinance that was either the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, OCRC, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission at the federal level, EEOC. But what wasn't included was the um, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development's Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, um, which it is for housing complaints at the federal level, protected federal housing discrimination. So that was simply added to the list of one of those referral agencies. The next uh, item here is probably the, the most involved. It has to do with the jurisdiction of the uh, commission. So um, I'm just going to dive right in. One of the things that also that came up last time was the concept that the commission shouldn't be a uh, sort of quasi-appellate body for state and federal agencies. The original uh, ordinance said that if, for instance, a complaint went to the Ohio Civil Rights Commission and it was fully adjudicated on the merits, that somebody could then bring a complaint back to the county's Human Rights Commission and they would have to abide by it unless it was de determined to be arbitrary or capricious. That's more of an appellate function. That's something that if uh, a determination is made, you'd normally go to a higher court. Um, so that, that type of review was removed. Now, the Human Rights Commission will still be able to hear complaints dismissed at state or federal levels for lack of jurisdiction, meaning that they weren't heard on the merits of the complaint. So if somebody, go, somebody files a sexual orientation complaint with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission says that's not protected under state law, we're dismissing your complaint for lack of jurisdiction, they can then bring that complaint still to the county. Um, secondly, the uh, jurisdiction was clarified to explicitly authorize the commission to hear complaints on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity without re first referring to state or federal agencies. That was sort of implied in the original version, but it wasn't explicitly stated, so that was simply made clear. Third, uh, the commission, uh, the, the substitute provides the commission authority to immediately adjudicate what I'm going to call hybrid complaints. And what I mean by that is somebody files a complaint on both a uh, protected category under federal or state law and a category protected only under county law. So, for instance, if somebody filed a complaint on, on the basis of sexual orientation and race, um, under the original ordinance, they would be required to file that, that same complaint with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission or the EEOC or whatever appropriate federal or state authority. What the amendment allows is that the uh, complainant can either, that gives them the option, they can either file with a federal or state authority or they can choose to adjudicate that complaint at the county level. But first, the commission has to inform that complainant that the rights and remedies available to them under federal and state law may be foregone or foreclosed if they decide to pursue it at the county level al alone. And if they do choose to file at a federal or state level, the county is not going to hear that complaint unless and until that um, the, the OCRC, EEOC, FHEO uh, adjudicates it on those merits. And then again, if they dismiss something for lack of jurisdiction, then the county could, could do it again. And then finally, um, catch-all language was added providing the commission jurisdiction to hear a charge of discrimination against any protected category, again, if the state or federal agencies dismiss a charge for lack of jurisdiction. And I know a lot of this is getting complicated and in the weeds. Really, all this is meant to do is say that if somebody brings a complaint, they're only being heard at one level at a time. So if somebody brings a complaint that's appropriately under state or federal law, they go to state or federal agencies. And if they bring a complaint that's really more or only available under county law, they'll be heard at the county level. And it's really just to prevent people from venue shopping or having a complaint be adjudicated at both the state and county level at the same time. So this was... There are a number of sort of complicated changes there, but that's, that's the general principle that um, we tried to address. Next uh, is the concept of determination and notice. So uh, this item came um, from the concern uh, expressed, I believe, at the last committee that the three days notice um, between it, so when a complaint is filed, the ordinance currently states that the commission has to, within three days, make a determination as to whether or not the complaint validly states a claim, and then after that they would have three days to notify a complainant. Um, because of the logistical uh, issues with doing that in such a short time frame, uh, we didn't want to open the county up to potential liability for failing to meet that deadline, so that time frame was expanded from three days, calendar days, to five business days. So now the commission has up to basically ten business days to notify complainants um, whether or not their complaint validly states a claim, and if they should go to a state or federal civil rights commission. 
Uh, the next item, uh, as was, I believe, uh, mentioned during the public comment, relates to false complaints. This is a, an addition to the legislation that would prohibit the filing of false complaints uh, or fraudulent complaints in bad faith intended to defame or cause other reputational or material harm to an individual or organization. Um, now, this is a pretty high bar uh, to meet a finding that a claim is simply unsubstantiated, meaning there's not enough evidence to prove that discrimination occurred, is not alone enough to prove a false complaint has been filed. However, if a respondent is able to show that a complainant is, uh, has filed a false complaint, that complainant could be subject to the civil penalties. Uh, they're the same civil penalties that the commission can apply to respondents who have been found to have engaged in unlawful discrimination. Uh, the next item uh, is basically uh, tweaking of the definition of the term veteran. Uh, again, under state law, um, military status and veterans are protected. This simply uh, mirrors what's in state law, and it pr clarifies that veterans include all persons who have completed service in the armed forces. Uh, the last item on this slide deals with the statute of limitations. Under state law, so the, the county's ordinance was designed in such a way that the filing deadlines, if you, if you believe you've been discriminated against, you can file a complaint with the county um, within a certain time frame. And under state law, that time frame is 180 days if it deals with employment or public accommodations, and it's up to a year if it's in the, in the area of housing. Um, and so the uh, ordinance was basically... The, the sort of the equities that were considered here was if the county gets a complaint, we have no ability as a county to change the statute of limitations for filing a charge at the state level. So if somebody needed to be referred to a state agency, we wanted to provide enough time for them to do that if we received it. So basically what we did was what we, we took the state deadlines and subtracted 30 days. So uh, the, the base filing deadline for complaints related to employment and public accommodations are now 150 days, whereas at the state it's 180. And for housing, it's going to be 330 days, whereas at the uh, state level, it's going to be a year. Any questions so far? I do. Okay. On the false claim, can we go back? Yes. Um, false complaints. What is the mechanism by which um, a false complaint would actually be submitted? Do you envision... The case is heard by the commission, and the case is that's held. They dismiss it, or they just hold that there's no discrimination. At that point, it, does the respondent then come back to the same civil rights our, our commission, human rights commission, and ask for a determination from that same body that it was frivolous, or do they have to make a statutory claim to the court? So the um, the. The, the procedures for that are not spelled out. The civil penalty that could be imposed in the ordinance um, is by the Human Rights Commission. So now procedurally, the Human Rights Commission can establish it's basically its own rules of procedure. Well, like debarment. Right. Similar, we, we spent exactly. years right. making it. Hopefully you could just give what our hard work <laughs> we produce to them. It's yeah. very involved with judges' participation. but. So adopting, okay, so we're not getting in the weeds with this. This is just a general thing that correct. somebody can, the respondent can do this somewhere, somehow, and it will be up to the commission to establish rules by which these false complaints would be submitted? Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. President, Mr. King, you were talking about not wanting to pe people to file simultaneous complaints, but if a person files at the state or federal level and, and the claim is, is not validated for reasons other than lack of jurisdiction, for example, if they find that, that there was insufficient justification for the claim, can they then come back to the county and, and, and file that claim at the county level, or is that not allowed? The, the ordinance only grants the Human Rights Commission to hear claims that have been adjudicated at the state or federal level if they've di been dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. So if, if the state or federal agency has made a determination on the merits and they said there's not a factual basis to support this claim, but we recognize that it's within our subject matter jurisdiction to adjudicate it, then that, isn't, that, is, that is not, I don't want to say appealable, because again, this isn't an appealing, an, an appellate body. Um, but that would not be something 
that the complainant, they could still file a complaint, but a respondent could say this was already adjudicated at a state level and is not, should not be heard at the county level. Okay, fine. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On that same point as far as statute of limitations, uh, and it was not for lack of jurisdiction, but um, the it, I don't know how fast uh, the state responds. Uh, I don't know how fast the process is, but let, uh, it takes 300 days before they get that response back. And they, the response is it's lack of jurisdiction. What happens to our statute of limitations? So our statute of limitations has a general, it, say you haven't filed any complaint with any agency, the statute of limitations is either 150 days for employment and public accommodations or 330 days. Then separately, if you file a complaint with OCRC, EEOC, or some other federal agency, and it's dis and you get a dismissal for lack of jurisdiction, and that's you know a year or two later, right. the ordinance provides that if you file a complaint with the county within 30 days of that order, the, gotcha. the commission okay. has jurisdiction. Here. Okay, and then uh, on the establishment of, of the false claim that uh, my colleague was, was raising. Uh, for example, there's a legitimate reason why this person has been served too much alcohol and you do not want to serve them in the, in the bar. Uh, and you making that determination as the bartender. Turns out that perhaps it's uh, the, the person comes back afterwards and says, uh, oh, you only threw, threw me out because of race. Um, truly, they were being thrown out on the basis of Dramshock Act or something of that nature. Uh, is that a false claim? And under this definition, where the person brings up, and we clearly was established when they brought it forward, that they, the person says, no, you only threw me out for race. They bring it to this commission on the race basis, and they can clearly establish that, no, no, uh, we have five witnesses and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so, so what the ordinance provides is that the, the, in order to establish a, a, it, be as a false or fraudulent, fraudulent complaint, it has to be made in bad faith with the intent. There, there's an intent component to this. So again, it would come down to the fact pattern, I think. Um, but you, they would have to show some intent by the person filing the complaint that they were trying to defame the bar or cause a, other, some other type of material harm to their reputation or, or you know, standing um, as, for, as the reason why they filed their complaint. If it was merely a matter of, hey, I believe I was discriminated in a good faith way, just discriminated on the basis of race, but the bartender said, hey, no, it was because you were, you know, overserved, then, then the bartender, it, the, the obligation, the burden of proof would be on the bartender to establish that my, my filing of that complaint was made in bad faith with the intent to, to defame him. And I know that that is one of the issues of the business community uh, I know that we had the Chamber of Commerce, the GCP, I saw him back there a little bit ago, come forth and, and talk on it on the one side, but I can can pretty well guarantee you that there are a number of businesses on the other side that have had that exact situation where it was on the basis of a legitimate reason, safety issues, health, whatever it happens to be, and then the, uh, the issue gets brought up under uh, the guise of... of some other uh, base that, uh, and they allege the discrimination, you're in court, you're defending it, and uh, uh, it clearly was a false false filing, but it becomes a very, very big standard for the business community to get over that, and they still have the expense of the cost and the and all those things out there. Yeah, and, and again... And it happens, uh, be, uh, you might be surprised at how often that happens. Right, and again, I, you know, it, if a claim is still found to be unsubstantiated, the complainant may not get any type of relief. So, I mean, they would be incurring those costs potentially at, at their own risk as well if, if it wasn't substantiated to be an actual um, act of discrimination. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Just what's different about this, for example, um, with other agencies that oftentimes there's caseworkers or advocates for the claimants. In this case, they would have to probably come in on their own or with their own attorney and spend their own money. So I think it's a little bit different from what you're thinking at other levels. I mean, I can see a difference that they would have to expend money on an attorney, but at those other agencies, they really don't. Well, I, I guess to keep the dialogue going, my, my assumption is that three or four of the attorneys that are here in the audience would be more than happy to represent in most cases on a pro bono basis. I would, 
I would think that uh, from the ACLU or any of those places that are at. I mean, they, they're taking time away from their business to come and testify. So I, well, I, you know, I would think that that's logical. I see a big difference in taking on a case and sitting here for two hours, but okay. What I'd like to do, um, if, um, if there are no objections, and if there are, I want to hear those too. I'd like to um, uh, move our substitute legislation um, and um, uh, to the, uh, uh, but not uh, be today voting this out of the Committee of the Whole, simply moving the substitute legislation, and then um, we'll take this up again uh, uh, on Tuesday, Mike. Mr. Chair, just one. I have one more slide to go through in terms of changes. Oh, so I didn't want to omit anything. I'm, I apologize. Um, but I can go through those relatively quickly. Um, this final slide. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the first bullet here simply says that um, the uh, diversity and inclusion efforts are not prohibited by this ordinance. So, for instance, the county's diversity and inclusion efforts to include uh, minority-owned businesses, female-owned businesses, um, are not, do not constitute unlawful discrimination. And similarly, for um, members of the public, uh, discrimination or uh, activities to include historically marginalized groups would not, again, not constitute discrimination. Uh, next, mediator qualifications. The current ordinance suggests, it doesn't spell it out, but it suggests that mediators must be attorneys. Um, mediators in a lot of instances are not attorneys and a lot of them are really good at their jobs. So this simply says that the mediators must either be attorneys or have some type of training in civil rights law. Um, the next couple items are simply uh, changing the definitional status of gender and familial status to basically comply with what's in state law. Again, we wanna be consistent with what's in state law so that we can use the case law that's been developed under state and federal law on these issues. And then finally, uh, in terms of remedy, in addition to injunctive relief um, and the administrative civil penalties that are provided for in the ordinance, this would allow the commission to award reasonable attorney's fees to complainants who prevail in their claim. Um, and this was really meant to mitigate any potential chilling effect that um, might exist for complainants to bring a claim of discrimination. If they do have to hire an attorney, um, they could at least be made whole for those costs associated with filing a complaint. So with that, uh, I'm I am done. Oh, uh, looking at the ordinance, there's a line item G for budget. What is the amount that would be um, on the line item? It says there shall be a line item in the county's budget to cover the operating expenses of the commission, including staff salaries. What type of number are we estimating? So at this point, um, the. Uh, the administration has not come up with a proposed budget for this. Uh, again, as of right now, the, the commission itself is made up of uncompensated attorneys, so they would serve at no cost other than there might be some you know, reasonable travel expenses. Um, the executive director is already an employee of the county, and so that would not be an additional cost in the budget. And then we're looking at potentially, depending on the volume of complaints that are received, um, one or two clerical staff to, to handle that volume. Um, I believe at this point, and I'll look at a WhatsApp over here, I don't expect there will be an additional budgetary request to set up this commission this year. There may be, in consideration of future budgets, uh, a line item set aside for the activities of the commission. But again, that would be within the purview of council's budgetary authority. Is the um, executive director, does he have the time to absorb what may be needed uh, for this service? Um, I, I believe that's the case. I would defer to him on that, and I know he's, he's not here uh, today, but um, it, it's my understanding that he fully understands the, the needs of the commission and, and, is, and has the, the time and resources to, to, uh, to get this thing up and running. All right, thank you. Council? Uh, uh, Mr. President, you asked uh, about does anybody have any concerns about uh, bringing it forward right this moment? And my only thought was we, we just had a lot of slides, a lot of information from Mr. King that uh, it was in case the first look was as they were being presented and would just ask that uh, we, we just have a chance to, to look at it before actually voting it out. Okay, does anybody else have a different opinion? Mr. Chair. 
Mm -hmm. President, I, I think we discussed these amendments mm -hmm. at the first mm -hmm. hearing on this in committee mm -hmm. and also have had a chance to to um, think about those changes and they're before us and I'm, I'm ready to uh, vote a substitute um, version of this today. Anybody else have, a, have anything to say on the matter? Hmm. Well, it appears that we are tied um, <laughs> in terms of um, our objections. Um, we will uh, not call the roll call. We will not call the roll call on um, on the substitute legislation. Um, but understand, we, we we to give people a chance to, to to look into these things if they are not completely satisfied. Um, uh, we're, we'll have a full complement of members, I assume, on Tuesday. And so I'm going to um, what I'm what I think I'm going to do is have a, a, a meeting, a, another committee of the whole, hopefully not a very long one, uh, another committee of the whole on Tuesday, uh, and 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 these the the substitute legislation will be up for a vote to to move to the council for second reading. Okay, okay. I appreciate that, Councilman Miller. Mr. President and, and my colleagues, I would like to uh, briefly present the concept of an amendment which will not be offered today, but it's only f for you to, to look at and, and consider and, and we'll see where we are on Tuesday. But uh, as, as most, most of you know, uh, when we adopted the equity, equity plan some years ago, uh, we created the Equity Commission and the Citizens Advisory Committee on Equity, uh, both of which have not yet been implemented. And uh, uh, in discussions with uh, uh, my colleague, Ms. Conwell, and, and also uh, we worked with uh, Chief of Staff Lycan and, and Law Director Triazi, and we thought that this might be an opportunity to uh, figure out how to right size these various structures that, that, that are out there. And, uh, and we came up with a concept which is basically a, uh, a tweak of what uh, Director Triazi recommended which is that, uh, first of all, the, uh, the Equity Commission would in fact be constituted and it basically consists of, uh, of various key uh, county directors. Uh, it does not create new staffing and, and the Equity Commission would focus on equity issues that are internal to uh, county government and that the Human Rights Commission that's being constituted under this ordinance would focus on uh, areas external to, to county government out in the community. And uh, these, uh, this aspect would not require legislation. It would just be done by general agreement as to focus. And the, the second part is that the, uh, the Citizens Commission on Equity would not be a permanent ongoing structure as exists in, in, in the current code, but instead we would uh, uh, follow the, uh, uh, so, something like the Charter Review Commission where it's, uh, where it's done periodically. And so the amendment says that the Citizens Advisory Council on, on Equity would be first appointed in 2020 and uh, every five years thereafter to obtain community input on the full range of equity issues in Cuyahoga County. And that it could also be constituted on an ad hoc basis by either the Equity Commission or the Human Rights Commission if there were a particular issue that, uh, that they wanted input on. So, uh, so that's what the proposal is, and, and uh, 
it's it's on your desk and and hopefully people take a look at it and think about it and we'll see where we are on Tuesday thank you thank you very much councilman uh, councilman Gallagher Mike if you could review the diocese recommendations and concerns and get back to me when you're done we'll do Thank you.